and welcome to the latest episode of the Celtic View podcast brought to you in association with Eden Mill. As always, we'd like to thank Eden Mill for their ongoing support of both Celtic Football Club and of the Celtic View podcast here. I'm Joe Donnelly, reporter at the Celtic View, and I'm joined today by one of Celtic's greatest ever goal scorers, the Hoops number nine, Lee Griffiths. Lee, first of all, thanks for joining us. No problem. Of course, unprecedented times, a little bit strange. How are you doing? How's your family? How's everything going? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously not a difficult, it's not a, an easy time for the players, the fans, everybody connected to the club, but the most important thing is that we stay safe and that we're all healthy and we, we make sure we're ready to go when we come back. Yeah, because obviously the, the health and safety of everybody, Celtic fans and everybody across the world at the moment is really, really important. And I know football ultimately becomes secondary in that process. Nevertheless, you know, as big football fans, big Celtic fans, we are missing it. We had John Kennedy on the podcast last week and he was talking about some of the challenges that the management team have been setting you guys. Keep me going. He mentioned the 5K challenge. He himself really fancied himself for the cycling challenge this week. I'm not too sure how he got on. But for you guys, I mean, has that been good to... Naturally, you want to be out training, you want to be playing games, doing your usual thing, but keeping that competitive edge, getting those wee challenges set to keep yourselves going? Yeah, I think Kendall would back himself on a a cycle challenge with anybody. Um, (laughs) The guy's a a machine. Um, But yeah, I mean, the the, the running part is part and parcel. I think most most players don't like running, um, but they need to do it to keep their fitness levels up so that we, when we do go back training we're, we're straight back at it and we're ready to go for games and how important do you think social media is in the middle of this I know that it's a kind of divisive subject in football some people like it some people don't but in times like this you know where nobody could really have seen this coming you know weeks ago never mind months ago social media is keeping that level of connection yeah I think it's, it's always nice to, to connect with, with people over the, the social media network um, just to let you know, everybody know what we're doing and, and how we're keeping. So I think they'll be in the dark most of all as well, knowing that, yeah, yeah. you know, what the players getting up to, how they keep them fit, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's good that, you know, our media team are on top of the ball and they've got, you know, different things for different players every single day to keep them on it. Yeah. Yes. I know you did your Instagram Q&A with the fans last week. How did you enjoy that? Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, you know, so many different questions and obviously I couldn't get through couldn't get through them all, but I got through, you know, three quarters of them and, you know, they Great, um, great questions to answer, um, yeah. and it, it's great for you know everybody, you know, get an insight of what you know the players are feeling at this difficult time. Any of the teammates giving you feedback? I know that some of the questions for yourself and the other players were about you know things like best dressed, who's the funniest, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I think Johnny Hayes gave me a bit because he says I like wearing um, tight jeans, but <laughs> you know, you're just trying to you just try and make it a bit um, a bit fun as well, um, yeah. and it's nice for the you know the what the fans they can expect or what they can, you know, see from a day to day basis, how we are how we are as a as a club and as a team. Part of missing the football and again, you know, can't say it enough that, that safety and health is of paramount importance. But a lot of the football um support is to do with routine, isn't it? I mean people enjoy going to the football every week or every second week if they're getting to the home games. For you guys it's routine, it's mixing with your teammates every single day. So that the chance to you know, still be connected to the fans. I know you've got the kind of toilet paper challenges, total challenges rather. So football players are getting to see what other football players are up to. And it is just keeping that kind of community across football in general. Is that fair to say? Yeah, of course. I think everybody is in this, they're everybody in the same boat. Um, you know, and you just try and make, you know, light heart of what you can just now at this difficult time for everybody. Um, and you just try and, you know, put a smile on people's faces and, and try to set other people little challenges if they're stuck in the house that, you know, they can't get out, but, you know, they want to try and do what us, us as footballers do and other folk, um, what they do, and um, they can set little challenges and, and see if they can compete it. And again, it's all about social media. They can put it on social media and as the players, we all see that. And at the risk of, of making us miss the football even more, I want to talk about your efforts on the pitch this season, Lee. Before we do, let's revisit your first competitive goal of the nineteen twenty campaign. <laughs> Griffiths, a chance for a goal, Griffiths pulls it, and it's gone into the back of the net, Lee Griffiths, one of only 29 Celtic boys, he's back, he's scored, and Celtic leads by three goals to nil. And we'll talk about that wonderful free kick against Nom Calju specifically in a moment, but firstly Lee, just looking over some of the stats, 11 goals this season, 8 since the turn of the year. 
four assists, I believe it is, three since the turn of the year. Again, you know, unprecedented circumstances with this postponement of the football. But particularly in this side of the year, you're back on the pitch, back scoring goals. You look like you've been enjoying yourself in, in football. Yeah, I think, obviously, being off for that many time and then come back, it was just trying to get in the swing of things again. And ultimately, I was... You know, I was always playing catch up with the boys because obviously the the Celtic boys are, are one of the fittest groups I've ever known, um, and I was just trying to play catch up to that. Although I was getting my fitness back to a certain level, I think the boys kind of kicked on again with the sports science team over the injured and that season. It's difficult to be playing at that period of time when you're going to be playing a lot of games and stuff. And I was just trying to, again try to catch up my fitness, and I think the Dubai break gave me a, a real good chance to to work as hard as I could over the, the eight-day period to to get that fitness back, to get my fitness levels up to a certain level. And then, you know, I've kind of kicked on with the manager and given me that run in the team and me and Austin striking up that partnership that, that is looking good so far and we need to keep it going. And I know that you've I've spoken to you since uh, you've come back in after January and really hitting the ground running. And I know how much stats and numbers mean to you in terms of keeping that going. Again, 11 goals a season, eight of them coming since January the assist the same four and three since the turn of the year. You're certainly doing the right things if you want to be improving your stats. There's only way to one way to do that, and it's on the pitch. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was disappointed that the league's league's been stopped. Ultimately, health and safety comes first. But for me, I was just getting into my groove again, and you know, the last game playing against them and scoring a hard trick, and then really looking forward to the the derby. Um, but you know. We just need to keep it, keep it going when we come back, um, and and basically try and go where we left off. And you spoke at the time about that Norm Kildare goal, the free kick. Um, how much it meant to you, MD that was there, MD that saw it on the television. You looked quite emotional on the pitch, and I know you've spoken about it. With the virtue of hindsight, because you know several months have passed in between. How do you look back on that now? Um, it was up there one of my my football and career highlights. You know, I've <clears> had a lot of highs and lows, but that's. And I mean, looking at your, your wider career at Celtic as well, Lee, 233 games, we've got you down to 115 goals. And I know how much he's, he's spoken in the Instagram QA about oh, three goals that means up to you. One of them was an on Calgary goal, one of them was your first against Hearts, and the other one was the 5 1 game, uh, the second 5 1 game of the 2016 17 season as your three favourites. And with 115 goals at the club, you've come quite a long way since that first one against Hearts at Tynecastle. Aye, definitely. I mean, you know, I raised Celtic had um, you know obviously put the bid in, and people raised a few eyebrows about you know me signing and stuff. But I've I've hopefully you know managed to shut them all up, um, and it's still at 29. I'm still going for you know more records. I think I need three more mm-hmm. to be in the the top 20 all time Celtic goal scorers. And if you think about you know the the great goal scorers that have been here over the number of years, for me to break into that would be you know, probably the biggest achievement of my career. Yeah. Um, and then I just need to keep going and see how many I can get before I finish. Which gives me a nice segue into what the features we've been running on the Celtic website um, over the last few weeks when things have been slightly different. We've been running a feature called The Greatest Goal Scorers, which looks at the top 21 goal scorers in the history of the club. It started with Jimmy McGrory, who tops the list with 468 goals. And then it finishes this Sunday with yourself, Lee, as you say, 115 Bobby Collins is number 20. Uh, he played in the late 40s and 50s for Celtic. He's got 117, which means, as you said, two goals to equal that and then three to take you into that that top 20 list. And I don't know if it's just because, maybe it's a personal thing about me getting a wee bit older, but the last 10 years at Celtic seems to have went in really quickly. And whilst it feels like you've been at Celtic for a long time, uh, a long enough time, to have to be pushing to be knocking on the door of that top twenty, it, it's it's a remarkable achievement, as you say, to be rubbing shoulders with some of the greats in this club. You know that that must be amazing for you. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think anybody's going to beat Jimmy McGrory's record of four hundred <laughs> goals. I mean, it's ultimately ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but it's it's one of the ones that you just got to try and score as many as you can. Um, you know, I was the first player in I think it was like forty odd years to score forty in a season. So. Mm-hmm. Um, we just need to keep it going, and uh, like you say, break into that 
top 20 mark would be unbelievable. Um, I still remember the day I signed for Celtic and, you know, a lot of people, again, had raised eyebrows, can I cut it up here, blah, blah, blah. You know, can they only do it at, at certain levels? But, you know, every level I've, I've played in with Celtic, I've, I've managed to score. So, you know, I've shut a lot of people up, but I've still got a, you know, a bit to prove and a bit to make sure that I'm back to my best. Yeah, and I know that you've passed John Hartson, Celtic goal record, not too long ago. And John's spoken quite a lot about how he spoke on the podcast um, earlier this week, or last week rather. You know, he'd love to see you just keep going, just keep going out, get the close to 200 past that and keep going after that. You mentioned that the 40 goals, uh, you got to 50 goals and 84 appearances at Celtic, I believe is the numbers there, which was quicker than Henrik Larsson. And I know that you're by doing this, you're becoming, you know, and you always have been your own player. You're setting your own records. Um, but I think it's easy to forget how quickly these records have been set as well and how far you're going as a player against the likes of John Hartson and, and Henry Larson, modern greats at the club. Yeah, I think it goes a little bit unnoticed, not by me, but by fans. Um, mm-hmm. And it's nice to be, you know, remembered when people actually do put the stats out there that, you know, I, I did get to, you know, 50 is quicker than Henrik Larson. Ultimately, I'm never going to be Celtic Henrik, Henrik Larson, but, you know, it's one of the ones where you just try and make your own name for yourself in the more in the, the history book. Um, yeah. Again, like you say, John Hartson, he was one of the first to congratulate me on beating his record, which, as a striker, you don't want, you don't want it to happen to you. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you just need to keep going and, again, try and make your own name for yourself. Yeah, and again, good back to that Instagram Q and A you did last week. You mentioned those three goals. Talk me through them very briefly. A couple of sentences on each. Why did they? Um, so why first and foremost does the Hearts goal that the first one stand out? I dare say it's because it was your first at Celtic. Yeah, it was. Obviously, the first goal at Celtic. There's always going to be pressure. The more games you go on, the less. Obviously, if you don't score, then there's going to be more added pressure on you. So just to get that mug off my back, just to. You know, finally say that I've scored. Ultimately, I would have liked to do it at Celtic Park. Um, but, you know, Rangers weren't in the league at the time. So if I had any other place to score, it would have been at Tynecastle. Um, and just so happens that, you know, we kept, I think Fraser kept his clean sheet record that day as well. That's right, yeah. Um, and it was just an all, all around good day. You know, first half, you know, was a bit nip and tuck. We were on top. And then the second half, we kind of blew them away and made it comfortable. Was Anthony Stokes that played the, the long ball to you? Ah, I was like a toe poke up the up the top of the pitch. I, He's quite playing quite deep for, for Anthony Stokes as well. Exactly. I, just to say that. I don't know why he was back in his own half. He never used to go back. So very, <laughs> very surprising that he actually tracked back. But no, it was just one of the long hopeful balls and I've kinda, of, you know, made a made a long ball a, a bad ball and a good one. Um, and thankfully I've tucked it away. Yep. And of course you spoke about the Cal Jugal already. The second 5-1 game um, of the 2016-17 season. What a goal that was as well. And I think it speaks volumes of that season. And of course, the success over recent years, but that season in particular, where you're able to talk about derby games and you mentioned 5-1, and people can be uncertain which one you mean. Of course, yours came at Ibrox. Um, I suppose that speaks for itself as well, as why to, that's among your favourites. Yeah, I mean, obviously the five-one game at Celtic Park will be remembered for for Musa's hat trick and you know the first first game for Rangers back in the league. Um, but the second five-one game, I think we played them twice in six days. Uh, we beat them in the semi-final at Hamden, and then um, at Ibrox. And I think you know the five-one scoreline was flattering for them because the amount of chances we missed in the first half was ridiculous. It could have been five at half time, um, but. You know, you got your rivals on their own backyard and beat them five one as easily as we did. I think it was yeah, a day a day for the fans that they'll never forget, especially me as well. You know, going to Ibrox and you know, going there winning five one so easily. Um it's it's one of the best games I've ever played in. It was certainly very, very entertaining to watch as a Celtic fan. I want to talk about uh, goal of the season. Voting for Celtic's player of the year, sponsored by Daffabet, is now open. And within which you can cast your vote for the club's goal of the season, sponsored by Magners. It's 10 goals. Um, among them is your second of three against St Mirren last month. Lee. You mentioned that yourself before we talk about it. Let's again hear how it unfolded at the time. James Boris. Boris on the edge of the box, plays it out to near Beaton. Just toe to with his man, lays it off to Lee Griffiths. Good bit of footwork at the edge of the box, great one, two. Oh, what a finish from Lee Griffiths. Brilliant link-up play between Griffiths and Tom Rogic. And another fine goal from the striker. It's two goals this afternoon. Raise his tally to 10 
for the season so far. He said once he get back into the start and 11 at the turn of the year, he was desperate to improve his stats. Two goals so far this half for Celtic, both from the striker. So Lee, talk us through that goal. It was, um, again, you know, you scored a hat-trick. It's almost as if you had some sort of sense that you might not be playing at Celtic Park for a while, get your goals in, get the hat-tricks for this <laughs> unexpected break. Uh, talk us through that second goal. Great piece of link-up play between yourself and Tom Rogic. Yeah, I'm, I'm gutted that my, my Cal U goal isn't he, um, nominated in the, the goal of the season. But again, it was I think it was Nero was at wide and he's played the ball inside. And I wanted to take a, a touch of my my feet and shoot um, but I can always like close down a bit quickly so I did like what? I've just kind of played at the Tom and playing with Tom you're always going to you know get chances um, to score goals and it's played a lovely way to pass straight back into my feet and I've managed to dink, dink all the goals going in I think it was going to go wide um, but this kind of took a spun off the ground and, and hit the post and went in so it was brilliant for a striker, you mentioned Tom Rogic there, and sometimes, I mean, a lot of the time, his reading of the game is so good. See, when, when you're linking up with him, you're, you're, you're coming across and he's played that ball just uh, in behind the, the defenders. Are you making those runs in your head already, knowing or anticipating Tom Rogic's intelligence as well, that you both are playing intelligently, that you can predict what he's going to play and therefore get there early? Yeah, nine times out of ten, he'll, he'll put it right on your the big toe mm-hmm. and he's that kind of player he's an absolute dream to play with mm-hmm. as soon as I play the next I'm going to get it back and 141 goals this season so far obviously before things changed uh, with the, the calendar being postponed whittling it down to just 10 I mean, you mentioned there you were disappointed that your Calder goal wasn't included but they're all quality goals uh, and of the 141 there are loads more which have could have featured on this list which speaks to how good this team has been not just over the course of the year, but over the course of the pitch. You've got Chris Iyer in there as well. You know, there's talent everywhere in this squad. Yeah. Like you say, there's there's goals all over the pitch and it's just not the strikers that are scoring goals and material does defenders. And I'm just waiting for Big Freeze to come up and take a penalty. <laughs> yeah, to make it. You'd probably make save it. it. Save it nah, well, to be fair, <laughs> they probably run on the line and catch it. Um, but no, it's, it's a great, great team we've got here and like you say there's goals all over the pitch that we can't just rely, be relying on certain individuals mm-hmm. and player of the year as well I mean, there's, there's so much talent <laughs> across the, the, the squad as well and, and just looking at some of those names because there are some years where uh, someone can be really excelling really pushing himself forward and for all everybody can be playing well there can be someone you go no I tell you what it's absolutely them but the fact that you're looking at these names this year and thinking it could go MD. That's again testament to how everybody's been at once. Aye, um, I think there was there's ten nominations for player of the year, and you literally could could you wouldn't be able to grudge anybody if they got it. Um, and it's one of the ones where, like you say, there's normally at, at teams there's normally, normally like two or three that are in the running for it. But to fact to say that we've got ten. Um, and again, you've been grudging them to have it. Was is a remarkable achievement for the rest of the boys. And are you willing to tip MD in there, or not willing to go that far? Um, I'm going to stick with my strike partner. I think Onsen for me is going to get my vote. I think the whole season has just been unbelievable. Um, mm-hmm. He's just kicked on to another level from last season. Um, and he just there's no end to the boys' talent. I think he's he's going to go right to the very top. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and he will be getting my vote. I know that we've spoken before interviews uh, between ourselves, Lee, about mental health. I know that you've obviously been very upfront about your own circumstances over time. And I know you touched upon this again, going back to that Instagram Q&A. Um, but during these uncertain times, what message would you give to people who are perhaps struggling a wee bit more than normal because of you know affected routines and not being able to get outside quite as much? Just to speak up. I think that's the most important thing, that people keep stuff bottled in. Um, a lot, and it it was it was the case for me that I kept things bottling up, um, and it, it will tip you over the edge. But the more you speak out, you know, there's loads of people that will be willing to listen and give you advice. And you know, if you can speak out, it might uh, might end up just helping you under like straight away, and then you know you can you can start you know enjoying life again. One of the things which I found myself doing a bit more in my my leisure time is um, firing up the PlayStation and just losing myself in video games. And I remember you'd once said that, well, she didn't play video games too much yourself when Moussa Dembele was still playing. 
here at the club that your son Reese used to choose him uh, over you and Pez to wind you up. Have you seen any more of that in this downtime? <laughs> no, I think since, since I'm back playing, he's been um, he's been all right. He's been choosing me again. Um, obviously, I've been missing his left now, so it's down to me and Odson. Uh, but I think he's preferring me again because I was back scoring goals. So. I suppose, and that's because we've made so much about the striking partnership, which you and Odson have made up top. But if the manager continues to play two up front, that means there should be no arguments in the house because he can well, play Odson and yourself. That'll be it. I think he's going to have to go with the two up front. Um, but obviously, because I'm his dad, he starts to favour me again. Um, but no, I think it's, it's brilliant that the players are, are getting back onto the pro Evo and stuff. And it's it does kill the time because, again, once you've worked out, you know, what more can you do? There's not a lot you can do. You can watch TV, but you know TV right now is very, very boring. So if you can fire up the PlayStation or Xbox and and get yourself online and and just play a couple of friendlies and and make sure you're you're having fun. Yep. I was speaking to Miles Jacobson at Sports Interactive, the guy that runs uh, Football Manager. I was interviewing him over the phone, which will be running over the Celtic website this weekend, and uh, he was saying that all their in-game advertising they've changed from any of the Sega stuff to mental health charities as well. So it's good to see MD that can chip in to these things. You know, I know you guys are keeping the conversation going about staying connected with fans and then these games are taking it upon themselves as well. It's good to see everybody kind of, again, just really fostering that sense of community in football. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's brilliant that they're, they're changing their, you know, in-game and stuff to the, the charities and, you know, it's going to help um, because people will be picking up the phone and, you know, donating as much as you can, and it's brilliant. Um, so, ah, it's, it's it's even better for you know players to to get on the game and, and make sure that they're they're having fun. Excellent, Lee. Pleasure to have you on the podcast again. Like we said at the top of the program and throughout, safety is of paramount importance. The health of the public is of paramount importance. Still, we can't wait to see Celtic back on the pitch to see you scoring goals again in the fullness of time, and back to what we do best: winning games and, and lifting silverware. Thanks again so much, Lee. No problem. Thank you. Take it easy, mate. Cheers.